Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Tanner Hara. I represent the Riverside University Health System Orthopedic Program. I'm here to give a presentation on the total joint arthroplasty and give an introduction as well as kind of explain what it means to have a total joint as well as the post-operative protocols. This is basically an instruction manual. You'll see the names below are the orthopedic surgeon and staff members that are involved with your care here at Riverside University Health System. So let's get started. First off, thank you for attending. This is an introductory course to the total joint replacement. We also discuss a little bit about physical therapy, discuss the PACE experience, as well as have some concluding remarks, including uh, answering commonly asked questions. So what is a total joint arthroplasty? Basically, arthritis is, comes from the Greek word arthron, which is joint, limb, or articulate. And itis means inflammation. Joint inflammation is, results in cartilage destruction. Arthroplasty, which comes from the Greek word arthron, again meaning joint, and plasin, again meaning to form, forge, or remake. So we're essentially remaking or reforming your joint. As you see in the picture above, the femur bone is the top bone, the patella is the bone in the front, as well as the tibia bone includes the lower leg. So this demonstrates that the inflammation of these cartilaginous structures ultimately results in what we term arthritis. So pictures are common. Uh, of the left demonstrates severe arthritis. That white, uh, curly, normally um, appearing structure on the left picture has been destroyed and now demonstrating some subchondral bone and significant wear. So the picture on next to that is a total joint replacement. That's where we resurface or take away that bad cartilage and replace it with our prosthesis. The same goes for a total hip. We replace the cartilaginous destruction with our metal prosthesis. And we additionally have uh, the opportunity to have a shoulder replacement. And this is, it goes along for the same thing. The cartilage is destroyed and we essentially resurface or replace that area. So again, arthritis is a big deal. One in five adults have it. It's the main cause of disability among people over the age of 55. There's different versions of arthritis, osteoarthritis, inflammatory arthritis, and secondary arthritis, but all of which leads to pain. 1.2% of the gross domestic product for arthritis and this is increasing. One million total knee arthroplasties occur every year. 427,000 total hip arthroplasties occur every year. 67 million adults by 2030 will have arthritis. By 2030, they say the demand for the primary total hip arthroplasty is estimated to grow by 174%. And the total knee is estimated to grow by 637%. So you aren't the only one suffering from this debilitating disorder or disease, but we're happy to hear to help and alleviate your problem. So this is your investment. You're investing your time. You're investing your time in the hospital with us. You're investing your time to heal, to rehab, and then to follow up. You know, there's the financial burdens of, of this as well. You know, you have your car, your house, your education. You're here for the total joint program. We're going to talk about the risks and benefits later. And then additionally, the permanency. After this procedure, you can't go back. We can't put back that cartilage that we do take away. The return, it's one of the most successful and beneficial interventions of mankind that we have created. And it's the best treatment that we know for arthritis. It's amazing uh, seeing the outcomes and the ability to resolve disability secondary to people's arthritis. So what are our goals? So there's really no cure for arthritis. We currently aren't good at uh, regrowing cartilage. Uh, stem cells are unlikely to be uh, in our lifetime. You know, it all starts with an inciting event, the final domino we often refer to it. So arthritis is a long-term background problem, and then patients will often complain of a trauma, a twisting injury, or something happened. And then since then, they can't go back. They continue to have pain in their knee. It never improves. So the goal of any treatment is to get you back to activities of daily living. Treatment options for arthritis is non-operative and operative. So we start with the safest and work our way and progress ourselves up the ladder. And it's a trade-off as we increase risk. So first off, we can do nothing. And we would consider that if there's significant comorbidities, 
or significant medical problems that warrant that any, any medical management would be inappropriate. Next, we can do activity modification that can begin with just simply resting. There's different types of exercises such as swimming instead of jogging, weight management, avoiding any painful activities. And then as well as there's DME, which is knee bracing and walkers to help with uh, alleviating the pain of the knee. Next, you can try physical therapy. There's joint protection, exercises uh, that can strengthen specific muscle groups around the knee. There's increased proprioception. And then range of motion uh, can help flush out the inflammatory products and absolutely uh, bathe or nourish the cartilage uh, of the knee or the hip or the shoulder. Additionally, the next step we can try are injections. Those include corticosteroid injections or as well as hyaluronic acid. Uh, this is a process from the rooster comb. And right now we're not showing that it actually helps uh, patients. Uh, it's uh, very equivalent to what we call the placebo effect. The next thing we can try are medications. They're the non-steroids, the anti-inflammatory medications. We call them NSAIDs, uh, but they do have risks. Uh, we can also try steroids. That's uh, we can try to help with the, calm down that inflammation. Again, those have risks. There's the nutraceuticals, the uh, glucosamine conjointin, MSN, uh, acupuncture, and then of course narcotics, which uh, the academy has come out and not warranted either use of opioid-based medications for the management of arthritis. And then there's the myths out there, the commercials that we see on TV, the copper bracelets, the magnets, the traction. None of this has shown to be beneficial truly in the management of arthritis and pain of arthritis. So what about operative options? Arthroscopic surgery, you know, it doesn't help with arthritis. It's one where we take the camera and go in and basically clean out the knee, clean out the uh, inflammation, and it's just shown to not have uh, good outcomes in the recovery. So for the knee, there's three compartments of the knee. There is the option of just doing a unicompartmental knee arthroplasty versus a total, which would include all three compartments. The hip, you can do a hemiarthroplasty, that meaning just replace the femur component, versus a total hip arthroplasty, which would mean to replace the acetabulum or the pelvis component as well. So the goals of this would be ultimately to relieve pain. Secondarily, it would be to restore alignment and stability and then maintain motion or retain motion. So the total knee arthroplasty, I'm going to go over the specifics of this. You often hear this in the medical slang shorthand. There's total knee arthroplasty, TKA, TJA, total knee replacement, total knee, total joint, total. What it is, it's not a new knee. It's more of a resurfacing, essentially like a cap on a tooth, a new tread on a tire. So you'll see the x-rays demonstrated on the left demonstrates severe arthritis of the medial compartment of bilateral knees. And then on the right, you'll see after a knee replacement, not only is that arthritis and that bone on bone contact gone, but the knee alignment is restored to more of a mechanical alignment. So I'm gonna show you pictures of what a total joint consists of. Uh, you know, I'm giving this uh, warning just in case you don't wanna see it. Uh, just turn away for a second and it'll be over shortly. So basically the total knee replacement uh, we first make an incision over top of the knee, reflecting the patella, which will then demonstrate the severe cartilage destruction. We then further expose the knee, and we take away that uh, destroyed or damaged cartilage, and essentially just that cartilage is removed. Very little bone is actually removed during this procedure, and then we then place our implants over top of that uh, then previously cut away cartilage. So that is the complete total knee prosthesis. Another picture of that as well. The com patella component is on the picture on the right. The femur is the metallic appearing uh, component. And then that white plastic piece is the polyethylene liner that we place in between the two metal prosthesis. And here's a further picture of that. The only thing you couldn't demonstrate with our picture very well is that tibial component. That's what goes inside the lower leg bone. And all these articulate and allow you to have less pain with activities of daily living. You might have bruising on your leg after the surgery and it can course down the leg pretty far all the way down to the ankle. All this is very normal and we wanna make you aware of this now so you don't have to be concerned during the post-operative period. 
Here's the bilateral knee incisions. This is kind of the average incision length. Different uh, surgeons may use a little bit shorter or a little bit longer incision, but all of which um, it's heal up very well and are cosmetically pleasing. The total hip arthroplasty, we'll go into it a little bit of detail, but again, the goal is to decrease the pain. So bad hip may not be painful, but uh, it's basically metal on plastic and not a new hip. So there's several approaches, front, side, and back. The posterior approach is the most popular and proven and accepted. The anterior approach is also an excellent option as well. There's pros and cons of both approaches. And then the super path, which is a specific approach that simply spares certain muscles as you enter from the uh, lateral side of the hip. The materials, there's plastic liners, ceramic and cobalt chrome heads, the implant companies and designs. Do you prefer to fly on a Boeing or an Airbus aircraft? And really, the simple answer is, is you just want to have the pilot know and be comfortable with the plane that they're flying. It's the same with these implants. Uh, as a patient, I wouldn't worry too much about these specific implant companies. It's more that you wanna make sure that your surgeon is comfortable with the implant that they're using. So here's an x-ray picture of a significant degenerative wear of a patient's left hip. As you can see, the hip is essentially bone on bone, and then now the hip is replaced with the metal prosthesis showing good alignment and restoration of the leg length. So this is a quick picture of a total hip arthroplasty, the incision occurring on the outer aspect of the leg. And this is the incision kind of in completion as it heals. So a uh, very small incision and, and cosmetically pleasing. So uh, questions we often get are, are you asleep during the surgery? And absolutely through different types of anesthesia, you will be asleep. There's parts of it that uh, you may be um, awake, but in a sense that you um, won't have any recollection uh, of what occurs. So uh, we often uh, recommend a spinal anesthesia for primary total joints. Uh, that allows you to have pain control, but then we give you additional medication to give you comfort and make you comfortable. So all of these things you'll discuss with the anesthesiologist. There's the other approaches such as a general, which means we put you entirely asleep and have to use a breathing machine to help you breathe. But have a discussion with your anesthesia department, which you will meet with prior to your surgery to have further uh, ideas of what your expectations are regarding anesthesia. This is an important slide reviewing the risks of surgery. We wanna set the appropriate expectations and have everybody aware of the risks of this surgery. The risks include pain, scar, infection, bleeding, fracture, loosening, dislocation of the hip, numbness, foot drop in hip or total knee patients, wound healing problems, leg length discrepancy, vascular injury, stiffness, allergic reaction, myocardial infarction, CVA, DVT, PE, and component failure. We tell you of all these risks so you are aware, but we do everything we can to mitigate these risks by using our total joint program as well as all the things we do in the surgery and prior to the surgery and even postoperatively we do everything we can to minimize any of these being an issue. Longevity, this is a question we often get. Not counting complications such as a fracture or infection. So the hip replacement survival rate is approximately uh, for 20 years, 80, or excuse me, 95 to 98% are still around. For knee replacement in a less than 60, excuse me, greater than 60 year old, 95% survival rate at 20 years, and if you're less than 60, 87% survival rate at 20 years, meaning that uh, younger patients have uh, more activity levels, so essentially they're, they're wearing down the tire a little bit faster and have to have a replacement. Satisfaction. Overall, this is one of the most successful surgeries we can do, so there's no pleasing everyone, so we want to set the expectations, complications, and again, we write in expectations because that we know is the most important thing. So you've been dealing with, and you are dealing with a lifelong disease. And we know as humans, we do not have the technology to make your knee normal again. So there's no new car smell. So our goal together should be to improve your joint pain, to make it manageable level and to return to things you enjoy to do, um, you know, basically in your daily life. I'm gonna have a brief discussion on the physical therapy aspects. So after your surgical procedure, while it be in the hospital, we get you out of bed 
the same day of your surgery. What that means is, is you are up and walking. Most of the time we'll have you weight bearing is tolerated on the operative extremity and we work with physical therapy two times during that day to make sure that you are up and moving. It is very important for your recovery process and to show you that you can trust your new implant. You go home with a walker for two to four weeks and then you transition to either a cane or a prior to assistive device depending on your conditions. So in outpatient, we have home health PT or outpatient PT depending on your insurance and your needs. So all of this will be set up for you. I'm gonna briefly discuss the PACE experience. So this is the experience that you are probably gonna currently go through. This is an individualized program that will help you and guide you through the total joint process. It's basically a roadmap and it gives you um, all the different medical experts that will be involved with your care, including orthopedists, anesthesiologists, and your primary care doctor. Additionally, we'll review nutrition and as well as home medications with you as well. And we have a specific orthopedic nurse that does all this. So the post-surgical uh, or perioperative surgical home is a patient-centered, team-based, a system of coordinated care that guides you through the entire surgical experience from the decision to undergo surgery to discharge and beyond. So early post-operative care, uh, post-op day zero is what we call the day of surgery. Post-operative day one would be the next day after. So you're up out of bed the day of surgery, you stay in the hospital for one to two days, you work with physical therapy every day, and you should plan to go home on post-operative day two. We're often seeing patients go home on post-operative day one, too. So just depending on your situations and pain control will all be factors in helping uh, get you home uh, out of the hospital. So we want you to be discharged home. We don't want you to go to a certain facility afterwards, such as a rehab facility. Home is the best place. It decreases your infection chance and decreases the post-operative complications that can occur when you do go home. So a home um, uh, nurse is rarely needed. And then we recommend that patients undergo physical therapy here at RUHS versus, uh, you can go to another place just depending on insurance. So most patients will attend physical therapy here at RUHS. And then some uh, patients, uh, you're gonna go home with some DME. What that means is it's, it's like a front wheel walkers or um, different things like that that can help you get around your house. In two weeks, uh, you'll follow up uh, before your scheduled surgery. Um, and then we uh, basically will uh, take out your uh, staples and check on your progress uh, with PT. We do have a weekly follow-up appointments uh, for the post-operative period just to make sure you're doing well. But this at the two-week mark is when we take the staples out. Uh, and sometimes you'll have sutures as well. Uh, six weeks, uh, we follow up, and usually you're completing therapy and doing well, and then we can have a three months, six months, one year, and two year, and uh, hopefully uh, you should be good, doing very well by that six month to one year mark. And um, you know, anytime through this process, it's all a recovery process. You're going to have ups and downs. Uh, we often get questions regarding blood thinners. So without treatment, 50% of patients would get a blood clot. So most patients while in the hospital are either treated with uh, Lofenox or heparin, and then you go home oftentimes on aspirin or some other uh, oral medication uh, that can help with preventing blood clots. And then the SEDs are squeezing a sequ sequentially compression devices. They basically squeeze your leg, and we cannot emphasize the importance of these things. Your job is to ask the nurses and everybody around to put them on, not to ask them to take them off. They basically have been shown to prevent blood clots in the leg and are very, very necessary uh, for your post-operative recovery to prevent DVTs and PEs. Pain management. So anesthesia will manage and be able to uh, essentially chime in and uh, be a part of the care of you during your inpatient stay. So we want to make sure that your pain is controlled, but we want to make sure that it's controlled safely. So we do offer different blocks and different medications uh, during the surgery and postoperatively to make sure that your pain is as controlled as possible. We want to avoid very, very strong narcotic-based medications as those can be addicting and thus also cause complications. So there's a fine line between controlling your pain and causing dangerous side effects such as respiratory, 
GI confusion and delaying your ability to get up and about with physical therapy. So it's very individualized and it will be based on your uh, preoperative evaluation. So the goal for you is, and for us, is to minimize that narcotic use. And this on cue pump is used by us. It's administered by uh, the anesthesiologist in a block form and it provides local anesthesia for uh, three to five days and it's shown to help with recovery time and reduce uh, side effects uh, commonly caused by narcotics. And your discharge planning, this will all be arranged for you by a case manager. We we'll work with your co-pays, your DME, setting up therapy, getting a work note, and et cetera. And you'll have somebody there in the hospital taking care of you in regards to that. So your activities, once healed, you know, want to avoid pounding type activities. So high impact running is uh, not the best and most beneficial for your new prosthesis. You want to consider low impact like swimming, cycling, walking, golf, doubles, tennis. And then the question we often get about is driving. And it's often when you're off your pain medications and around four to six weeks uh, is an acceptable amount of time postoperatively before you can begin driving. So you're going to have a perioperative clinic appointment that will optimize you. You're going to complete some forms, do an EKG, get some lab work, all prior to your surgery. The HibaCleanse, uh, which will be a uh, solution that we want you to bathe yourself. We want you to do it three days prior to surgery, and then no shaving your lower extremity seven days prior to surgery. You want clean clothes and uh, um, um, towels and washcloths for three days. We need you to stop ibuprofen and aspirin five days prior to surgery, focus on good diet, good nutrition, avoid smoking, no eating the night before surgery, and then you will get a phone call regarding your date of surgery. You will get a call the day before and tell you when to arrive. And lastly, your dressing could potentially be an Aquacel AG, which will be a, uh, a waterproof dressing that will help uh, um, keep your incision clean dry. So thank you first off uh, so much for attending. I want to uh, uh, review kind of these final questions that we are often asked as providers in the orthopedic department. So the first question is, why are you recommending this procedure? So we reviewed all the reasons uh, or the, the, uh, what arthritis is and the treatments uh, that are available for arthritis. And if your arthritis is significant enough, where you have failed all the conservative treatments, then the total joint arthroplasty is the final uh, answer for your pain and will help you uh, restore your quality of life. How successful is this procedure? We reviewed the success of this procedure is one of the most uh, beneficial things that as we as humans have been able to do. Uh, we have excellent outcomes as demonstrated here at Riverside University Health System as well as elsewhere with the total joint arthroplasty. We've already reviewed the risks that are involved with the surgery. And then will I need any additional surgery after this procedure? So hopefully it's a one and done approach. As long as we avoid any complications, these prostheses can last 20 to 25 years and even longer. And so hopefully there's no further surgical procedure that's needed. We've already explained how the procedure is done, the incisions that are made and what our techniques are. We've already discussed about the anesthesia, whether to do spinal or general will be discussed by your anesthesiologist. And what would happen if I decided not to have this procedure done? Well, the thing with arthritis, it's a common condition, it's a chronic condition, and it will continue to persist through the rest of your life. So it may wax and wane, meaning it gets better and worse, but ultimately, if you're to the point where it's not getting better, then this is pretty much the time to have the procedure done. Will it be painful afterwards? So we just talked about the post-operative pain regimen that we have been able to create to help with modulating your pain and making sure that you are as comfortable as we can make you through the post-operative period. How long does the recovery take? You're walking the same day of surgery. As far as walking normal without a limp and with minimal pain, you have to be patient with that. Sometimes it can take more like three to six months where you're really walking around uh, the neighborhood and feeling quite comfortable with your total knee. So it is a recovery process, but trust us, it is absolutely worth it in the end. We hear that from patients all the time. And when can I go back to my regular activities? You can go back to your regular activities of daily living approximately around that same time of three to six months of just depending, but everybody's different in their recovery process. So 
So again, I'm Dr. Tanner Hare, and thank you so much for spending your time with me. And I look forward to meeting you as well as all the other uh, patients, and we look forward to taking care of you. Thank you so much.